And welcome everyone. Um, so I'm Hannah. I'm the assistant director at the Blue Hill Library and I just wanted to say a quick good evening and welcome to all who are able to join us for this virtual program. We're very excited tonight to have Richard Dietrich uh, to speak about his new book in pursuit of history. A beautiful book. We've got copies of it at the library um, that you could check out and there's also copies available for sale at Blue Hill Books. So if you want to support our local bookstore you can go in and pick one up or they're shipping all around the country. So if you love Blue Hill and want to support a local business here, even if you can't be here right now, like Richard, you can still buy your copy from Blue Hill Books and have them send it to you if you want. Um, H. Richard Dietrich III, who we will be hearing from tonight, is president of the Dietrich American Foundation, which was established in 1963 and focuses on 18th century American fine and decorative arts. He's a summer resident of the Blue Hill Peninsula. He's going to be sharing images from the book in this online presentation, speaking about the history and uh, relating it especially to the history of the Blue Hill area for us. And then we'll have time at the end for questions as well. So uh, please join me in virtually silently welcoming Richard and I will pass it over to him. Great. Hannah, thank you so much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, um, I, I am just so honored to be here and it's uh, something that when this talk was first um, thought about it was going to be in person and then as the pandemic evolved and we all realized that that was an impossibility, um, you know, this was, this was thought about and it's so much fun though, I think that I'm able to give this talk but I, I love that I can see all of you while, while we're doing it and I think that um, the Q&A will be fun. So I'm going to run through some slides and give a presentation because the book is so image rich and I'd love to show you some of those images. And as Hannah said, there is, um, there are at least, there's at least one copy, hopefully, maybe even others at the library. And then um, please, if you're thinking about buying it, please do think about buying it at Blue Hill Books. It's such a great store and it's great to support a local independent bookseller. And one thing I do want to mention is um, a lot of you already know how to get in touch with me, but if you do buy a book or you've already bought a book, part of these things is always a book signing. And I realize that that's impossible right now. But if you email me, and I'll just tell you my email, and some of you already know it, but it's H. Richard Dietrich, D I E T R I C H, so H. Richard Dietrich at yahoo.com. And if you email me, I'll write a note and, and mail that to you so you can stick it in the book. Um, so it's sort of a, 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 a very socially distant signing method. And um, I'd, be, I'd love to do that. So um, the book that I'm gonna be talking about is, is this book. And again, as Hannah said, In Pursuit of History, A Lifetime Collecting Colonial Art and Artifacts. And the book was produced by the Dietrich American Foundation. We decided as a board uh, to do this book, both to further scholarship and also to uh, really describe a collection and a collector. And so the collection is a foundation. And it was established in 1963 by my father, H. Richard Dietrich Jr. He's the one who amassed this collection. And what we essentially are is a lending library of objects. So we put things on loan in museums, historic houses, um, different cultural institutions. And at any given time, we'll have things in about 30 different places around the country. And um, I wanna, you know, one of the things just briefly, we've been, we're new to Blue Hill and uh, it's been several years since we uh, made roots there. And we just adore the community, and it's really the people on this Zoom that make it so special. And part of the thing that also I think really makes Blue Hill special are the institutions. And so one of them is the, the Blue Hill Library, of course, which is a real center of the community. And then you also have these great historic institutions like the Jonathan Fisher House, the Historic Society, and, and then that kind of more recent history of the musical side of Blue Hill, like uh, Kneisel Hall. Bagadoos Lending Library. And for such a small community, this is a really rich tapestry of cultural and historic and um, you know, nonprofits that, that are kind of connective tissue to this community. 
And then another nonprofit I just want to say that I've been involved with that I that is is doing great work, a small nonprofit is the Shaw Institute. And again, that's environmental advocacy. But nonetheless, this is all that that you know what makes this community special, and then of course the schools. So what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to share my screen right now and start running through some slides with you. So let me try to do that. And I've got a PowerPoint. Um, I hope everybody can see that. And so again, there's the cover of the book. Um, and there's uh, the full book cover. And actually down below, there is a mention of a discount. I hope that you buy it at Blue Hill Books. If you do, it's being distributed by Yale Books. And if you were to go to Yale Books, you can receive a discount, but you'd be paying for shipping. But the book is $50 and Yale Books is offering a 25% discount, which is really generous. And the um, code for that is Y-E-I-P-H. So Y-E and then I-P-H is for In Pursuit of History. And so the design of the book, um, the reason I wanted to show this full jacket is the design, we turned to a, a firm called Miko McGinty and Company in Brooklyn, New York. And it's a small firm and it's just a really devoted small group of, of um, you know, of, of really truly artists. And they're the ones who advised us on all this great um, design work. And I hope you'll, you know, see that as, as I share images. And then the photography was really important. And for that, we turned to um, Gavin Ashworth, um, who does a lot of great photography around three-dimensional, you know, decorative art objects. And then also Cliff Salen of the William Reese Company in New Haven did the photography for the books and manuscripts. Um, there's the book in the Smithsonian American Art Museum that was uh, pre-COVID. Uh, which seems so long ago. You know, this was back in January. Ginger and I visited the museum and we were delighted to see the book there. And then of course in mid-March, everything um, kind of shut down, so. Um, but here's an image of my father. And this is taken in 1963. And here he, he graduated from college in 1960. So he's about 25 years old here. And, um, he just uh, really started early with his collecting. And I just wanted to share um, a quick image and I'll talk more about him. So the, the family story, this is important and I get into it in the book. I'm only gonna touch on it briefly here, but the family story really revolves around this business, Luden's Cough Drops. And it's something that um, my grandfather and my great uncle purchased in 1928. And they did it at the kind of um, just astoundingly young ages. My grandfather was 19 and my great uncle was 24. And they floated a bond. They bought it from William Luden, who was the, you know, the, the kind of um, financial or business genius behind it all. And he wasn't you know, looking to kind of um, get out because he needed to financially. He just really wanted to retire. And he was looking for people to take on the business. And, my grandfather and great uncle had won over the Reading business elite and they, um, as I said, they floated a bond and they had an uncle who was really kind of a mentor. He never had children and he took them under his wing. And so this was the family business and it was um, a big part of obviously their lives, but it also was a big part of my father's life. When he graduated from Wesleyan in 1960, he went on to business school, but in 1962, his father died and the uncle had already passed previously. And so here suddenly somebody, my father, who was thinking at some point down the line, he'd uh, go into the family business here, suddenly it was thrust upon him at the age of 24. And I don't think, you know, it wasn't lost on him that that was the age that his, um, his father's older brother, his uncle, um, you know, was when he bought the company. So um, again, here's, here's an interesting item. This is a view of Wesleyan University. And this is um, a carved sperm whale tooth. And it was done by um, a, a scrimshander um, known as the Connecticut Cityscape Engraver. And so again, my father went to Wesleyan. This is an early depiction of Wesleyan from the 1830s when Wesleyan was 
first founded. The tooth was done in the early 1840s. And this was something my father um, collected very shortly after graduating. And he basically, when he was at Wesleyan, this, this idea of collecting is something that, that, that he um, just, you know, kind of got this bug that he wanted to collect things. And what he collected then were, were works that he enjoyed as a reader. So um, second editions, maybe first editions, if he could get them. But he wasn't collecting um, really, you know, important material then, but he was collecting what he could. And, and you know, it may have been Herman Melville, a later printing of Moby Dick, or it would have been F. Scott Fitzgerald or, or Ernest Hemingway or the likes. But after he graduated, again, in 1962 with, with, you know, getting into the family business and having to manage his father's estate, suddenly he had a lot more means and he was able to really start um, collecting. And so here's another early piece. Um, he collected, the, he bought this in 1963. And um, Really, his first again, his first love when he was in college were books and manuscripts or books. And then, uh, as he as he got out, um, one of the things that he really just uh, was so drawn to were these early manuscripts, so letters. And in this case, it's a letter from George Washington to his nephew Lund Washington. And um, Lund uh, was the caretaker during pretty much all of the Revolutionary War at Mount Vernon when Washington was away. And here, what's really, I mean, there are a lot of things that are remarkable about the letter, and I'm just showing a detail of it. But I think the great thing about this is, is the date. If you look at the top, and I don't know if you can make that out, but it's Falls of Delaware, South Side, and then it's 10 December, 1776. And the letter was began on that date, and then it was ended on the 17th of 1776. And Washington's writing this from his tent. And of course, then eight days later, Christmas night, uh, they crossed the Delaware and they attacked the Hessian garrison at Trenton. So the letter, one of the things that's miraculous about it is, is the subject matter about trembling for the city of Philadelphia and all this talk about the predicament of the army and how desperate it is. And then the other thing that's amazing is his just detailed notes about Mount Vernon and the things that he wants Lund to do, the height of the plantings, the type of trees that should go in in the spring, um, talk about horses that should be traded and just, you know, this sort of the minutia of Mount Vernon is detailed in this letter. Um, this is a, another letter that was acquired um, soon after that. And again, this is a, a detail as well. And um, this is actually Alexander Hamilton to the Connecticut delegate, um, Jeremiah Wadsworth. And what Hamilton is doing here, and, and I'm just showing the sort of the tail end of the letter, but he's urging Wadsworth to vote for anybody except Jefferson. And so for everybody who's um, now seen Hamilton, the musical live streamed or just, or heard the lyrics or seen it on Broadway, um, you know, this is kind of that great Hamilton, A dot Ham, here it's A dot Hamilton, but he's, he's, you know, just in his kind of fight with Jefferson. And I thought that was fun to show. Um, this, this is actually another detail. This is, this is something that is no longer in the foundation's collection, but was probably the most important book that my father had ever, ever purchased. And this was bought, um, in 1966 and it was by, it was uh, being sold by Henry Flint. And what Flint was doing is selling some of his collection to fund, um, the establishment of Historic Deerfield is really as a, as a working nonprofit to invite guests and, and restore those houses. And so this was Washington's copy of the Acts of Congress. Um, it's from 1789. And here it's the, it's the Constitution was passed. And so this is Washington's bound copy. It's about 120 pages. And what's wonderful about it is here you have this great Washington signature, but then throughout you have annotations of Washington. And we sold this, we, you know, felt the need to sell it to raise money for the Dietrich American Foundation to do the kind of things we, we need to do. And the happy coincidence is that the buyer was Mount Vernon. And so it can be found at Mount Vernon in their, in their library and it's been on loan and they're, they're just doing exquisite things in, in interpreting, which is just a wonderful thing. Um, 
that same sale from the Flints. This is a, a copy of the Federalist. And um, again, you know, this is Hamilton is um, a big part of this, writing 51 of the essays. And um, um, this one was um, uh, purchased in, I'm sorry, that both of those were purchased in 1964. So again, this is, you know, just a, a wonderful copy. It doesn't really look like much, but um, what's really kind of incredible about it is the pages are uncut. And so if you were to go and cut those pages like they would have done to, to sell it, um, it just happened that it was sold uncut. Um, you know, you'd be seeing things that, that nobody had seen before. Um, this, this is going backward in time a bit. This is, um, this is a map, as you can see. And the reason I'm kind of jumping around in time is, you know, going um, forward and backward is that the way that we did this book is we decided to write it in describing how the collection is formed. And so this, this, this chapter was done by Bill Reese, who was the incredible book and manuscript dealer in, in New Haven, Connecticut. His business is still there. And um, Bill led us off. I was lucky enough to, to identify, we as a board were lucky enough to identify these great authors. So Bill wrote this section and, and he came up with this idea to describe the collection as it comes in uh, to the collector. And so again, this is an early map. It's one of Ben Franklin's early important works. And it was um, something that was delineating the boundary between the pens of Pennsylvania and the Lord's Baltimore of, of the colony of Maryland. And then you can see Virginia down below. And so this came with a um, pam pamphlet, you can see, that accompanied the map. And it was really an important piece then because it was, it was designating this, this important border between these two early colonies. Um, another earlier piece, this is 1690. And again, Pennsylvania, this is William Penn had this published in, um, in London. And what he's doing here is he's, it's kind of a sales piece to market his new um, colony in Pennsylvania. And it's a plan, as you might be able to see, of Philadelphia. You've got the um, Schuylkill River on one side and the Delaware River on the other side in this very orderly grid plan that is really present day Philadelphia. Um, and jumping ahead a little bit, I put this in, I mean, this is kind of a great nod to Blue Hills musical, um, you know, heritage. And this is um, one of the first printings of the Star Spangled Banner, of course, Francis Scott Key. And this is the, the sheet music. And so um, while more of these were produced back then, only four are known to exist now. And this is, um, of course, this is, you know, later in time. The other item was 1690, this is 1814, and um, written during the War of 1812. Um, this is a kind of fun piece. This is going back to Ben Franklin. And this is sort of this amazing psychedelic um, thing. It almost looks like, you know, you should be staring at it and trying to see a three-dimensional image pop out. But Franklin here um, is describing to a fellow member of the Royal Academy of Science this circle of circles that he's invented. And if you can see, actually, maybe you can see my cursor. There are, there's a middle point and then there are these four different points. And so there are five points. And regardless of which you choose, however you travel out these numbers, the numbers um, sum to 360 degrees. And he's describing all this in this, in this fine hand. And he's kind of telling this, this gentleman, you know, if we get a chance to sit down, I can show you all the other great properties of this circle. So again, I, I think this is fun. It's, um, you know, it's, it's early. It's, um, it's um and it's one of uh you know just showing the the kind of the genius of franklin and the curiosity of franklin um again ben franklin this is an interesting piece this is um uh 1766 and it's a british printing of a of basically an argument against the colonies opposition of the stamp act and so it's a rebuttal to you know all the arguments against the stamp act and it's strongly saying that the Stamp Act is important to enforce. And here, this is Franklin's copy. And what Franklin is doing is, is annotating all these copious notes. And he's clearly um, you know, doing that to, to print his own rebuttal to the rebuttal. Um, this is another neat piece. 
and visually, I think it's just um, kind of marvelous. It's, it's all these um, wax seals that you can see, but if you read, if you can make them out, you see a Joseph Wharton, there's a, a William Franklin, there are a number of other members of the Wharton family. There's a, there's a Galloway, who was Joseph Galloway, who was um, really a very influential politician pre-Revolutionary War, picked his side with the British and ended up fleeing uh, with the British Army uh, with General Howe. And so it's just, um, it's a very interesting looking piece, but then the, the content is interesting too. And this is basically all these people are petitioning the crown to um, be allowed to get land out in the Illinois County, you know, Illinois country. And of course that would be Indian land and that would have been in violation of the uh, proclamation line that ended the French and Indian war. And so the British were really reticent to infringe upon any of that territory. And this is one of the things, I mean, there were other things that, that were sort of the linchpin of the revolution, but this was one of the things, this sort of, desire on the part of the colonists to travel west and um, explore this, this territory and really claim it. And the British crown uh, refused this p petition. Um, this is another, this is visually, I think, really interesting. This is part of after the French and Indian War. Um, all these plans were, were drawn of these forts that were part of that conflict. And it was, um, both to really show the kind of the might of the British Empire. And this one is um, in upstate New York, it's, it's uh, Fort Stanwix. And this was in Oneida Indian country. And um, so at Oneida Station, and it's just, again, it's very interesting looking, 1758, it's, it's early. Um, the Oneida interestingly were, were allied to Washington in the Revolutionary War. And in fact, saved Lafayette from capture at one point. Um, so it's interesting to see, you know, that Indian story was very much a story of the early Americas and the, you know, the way the Indians had to kind of navigate um, alliances with the British and the Americans. And so jumping farther ahead here, um, related in some ways to the Indians, this is um, the Wagon Road Guide. So this is as, you know, the country is just transformed. It is a country at this point and it's 1858, of course, the Great Migration West was in um, 1849. And then after that, subsequent years, it became safer and safer and still with a lot of hardship. But, but here by 1858, there were printing guides to you know, the best way to traverse that, that country. And this one, um, this one was, um, um, so it's the trail following uh, let me see if I can find. Anyway, um, I'm sorry, I can't make that out, but um, exactly which, uh, which route out west that is. But this guide would have told you where to stop and, and where to buy provisions and a kind of a how-to travel guide. Um, and then back to Washington. Um, this is Washington congratulating Benjamin Franklin as eight years as minister to France. The date is 18, uh, 1785 here, and, um, and it's just a, a letter with a lot of warmth for, for the older statesman, Franklin, and by this time, of course, Washington is president. So Washington, getting away from some of the, um, the books and manuscripts, these are um, Chinese export porcelain in the collection, and these are um, part of a service, and it's a little hard to make out what that motif is, but what it is, is it's a depiction of Washington's tomb. But it's actually um, not the actual tomb, it's, it's a rendering of something that they imagine the tomb might look like. These are from very early on, after Washington's death, he died in 1799. These are around 1800 or 1801. And what's amazing about these is that they're made in China for the American market, and a Philadelphia family, Joseph Sims, ordered these. It was part of an entire service. These were what were called custard cups with lids. And as you can see, the tomb is sort of a rendering. There's an eagle on top and then a weeping willow tree in the background. Um, Washington's tomb wasn't until the 1830s, and that was at Mount Vernon. And then, of course, the, the monument to Washington in DC begun in 1848. Um, so, this is, um, this is 
land that my father and his two brothers bought. And they bought this in the late 60s. And by this time, he's running Luden's Cough Drops. And the brothers are also working uh, with Luden's Cough Drops. And uh, part of their plan was to think, let's buy land um, west of Philadelphia and let's start um, kind of vertically integrate and start a, a dairy farm and also land that would be um, field crops. And so they bought about 1,500 acres and a lot of it was under cultivation as corn and soy. And then the important part again, the, the real impetus was this dairy farm. And so, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump ahead here. The dairy farm, uh, here we can see that the herd of cows are part of the herd of cows. And the dairy farm was state of the art at the time. And uh, the idea again was to supply all this milk, fresh milk for the milk chocolate at Luden's. And uh, sadly, about the exact time that the farm opened, best practices kind of migrated away from fresh milk and went to powdered milk. And so candy makers weren't using milk in that way, they were just using powdered milk. And so none of the milk from these cows ever made it into uh, milk chocolate at, the, at Luden's. But what was kind of funny is that some of the milk chocolate made it back to the cows. And so the Fifth Avenue bars at the company um, would break along the line and they'd you know, kind of uh, take scraps off the conveyor belts as they'd, as they'd go and only the perfect bars would go into the wrappers. So some of that leftover scrap candy bars uh, made it to the, um, the cows ground up in their feed. And I actually gave this presentation to um, my daughter Olivia's class when she was in first grade. Not this whole presentation, they would have hated it, but, but this part. And uh, one of the kids said, oh, that's where chocolate milk came from. Um, again, back to the, the farm, this is on the, the land out there. And, and right now that 1500 acres and the pre, the, you know, what used to be the dairy farm is now actually in conservation easement. And it's just a story I'm really happy about. Um, we partnered up with a land trust and 600 acres is now in park and preserve and then 900 acres has been sold to people for either farming or for homes. But all of that is going into, has gone in already to conservation easement and there are trails that run through the land. Um, this is the house where my father grew up. I mean, I think, you know, in talks like this, you kind of have a curiosity, who was this person? And this is where I grew up as well. And if you can see from my cursor, you can see a line right up here in the field stone. And that original house was actually just a room over room. And this was uh, Pennsylvania Fieldstone. It was built in 1721. And then in owner, um, 1721, there were a couple owners, a couple families. And then in the 1790s, uh, um, I'm sorry, in the 1760s, a family um, ended up buying the farm and they were the Millers. And for 200 years, it, it stayed in that family. And what was interesting is during the Revolutionary War, um, you know, at that point, it would have been expanded out to here and a little bit out on the other side. But in the Revolutionary War, this was a very productive farm. And about a mile down the road, the first military hospital in the United States, then the colonies. And it was something that George Washington decided was essential that there be a a uh, significant military hospital. And when the Continental Army uh, was in Brandywine, um, the Battle of Brandywine, and then also in, in uh, Valley Forge, as we all know about, um, it wasn't so much the wounded soldiers, it was the sick that were in the hospital. And then if they were so, the hospital was so overwhelmed that a lot of soldiers were put up here at this farm. So, so that was kind of as my father, you know, owned this property and thought about it, that was again another huge part of his sort of inspiration was this idea of this place. And you can see in the next picture, this was an in internal shot of the house, this was the den. And here he kind of got away in the early 70s from books and manuscripts and started buying old chairs and, and desks like this slant front Pennsylvania desk, Chester County. Um, paintings, you know, more three dimensional objects, fine and decorative art. And then recently, we as a foundation um, decided in, in really, as we did this book, to do an exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And this is a place, the Philadelphia Museum of Art is really where the concentration of our art objects are anyway. 
and we've had things on loan there for, for decades, and we have a very close partnership with them. Two of the board members on the foundation are actually um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Kathy Foster and David Barquest, and uh, they're just a tremendous source of you know, um, support for the board. And so we did this exhibition, and Debbie Reebok, our curator, who was co-editor of this book with me, did a terrific job. It's not a big exhibition, but it's a great representation. Here we have the Chinese export items. We have some kind of more folk-related things. This is actually a quilt uh, depicting the life of James Buchanan, um, a uh, Chester County or Moantongo Valley um, painted chest. Over here, we have the, the Philadelphia-related um, furniture, a tall case clock, a painting, some silver. And then this is uh, some New England items. This is, this is a Newport uh, dressing bureau uh, by the Goddard family. And then this is this great slate top table. So it actually has a slate top and these great droplets here, uh, William and Mary style. And then this wonderful John Singleton Copley portrait of a Boston merchant, Josiah Quincy, and some silver. Um, here, whale trade items are, are kind of a big part of the collection as well. And it's an interesting um, aspect of all of this. And they're later, you know, most of the things in the collection are colonial period, as you could probably see, but these are really more 1740s. And these are interesting depictions of different scenes, like the one that, that you saw, the, the Wesleyan cityscape engraver. This is a whale bone, and it's uh, carved. And then here's this bent harpoon that was in a whale, the poor whale. Um, but it was bent up and mangled in the, you know, as, as the whale was kind of tugging to get away. Here's another aspect of the collection, kind of related in some ways to um, maritime um, objects are a big part of the collection. It was a fascination of my father. And so we have some of this China trade related items and uh, um, this not so much China trade, but a, a British jug which it, with a glazed enamel depiction on the, on the side of it. This is a painting of the um, Gary Earth is the Constitution, War of 1812, and then here's a China trade uh, clipper ship. And so here, again, this is another scene inside my father's house. This was the formal room, and this was really kind of his, you know, proudest assemblage of things. This was the first major piece that he, um, that he bought. This was this great... Um, chest um, that you can see the, the kind of the, the serpentine side of the chest. Um, Boston by um, a, a carver named Elliot Gould. And then on top is this great um, copley portrait of a boy. Uh, the boy's name is John B. Holmes and he has a pet squirrel which is really kind of an amazing thing. And then um, a Paul Revere teapot so and a Revere print. And here it is in the exhibit. So the exhibit, Debbie Reebok, again, was trying to create some of what it, things looked like, this pairing of objects that was in the home. Um, again, there's the, the chest and the Revere and the Revere print of the Boston Massacre. And there's a close-up. Washington is a big part of the collection. This is a Quaker art, artist, Edward Hicks. A lot of people will recognize Hicks from Peaceable Kingdom, Penn's Treaty of the Indians, some of these more allegorical scenes that he did. But he also was um, really enamored with Washington, having as a boy seen Washington march through his hometown when he was a boy and Washington was an older man. But it, it just left this incredible impression on his life. Some Washington related items in here. Here we have one of those custard cups that you saw. You can kind of get a sense of the small scale. And then here is the miniature um, that I will zoom in on. So this is on the cover of the book. And this is really one of the kind of the treasures of the collection. This was painted by James Peel, um, who studied under uh, Charles Wilson Peel, so the great Peel family of painters in, in uh, Philadelphia. And James Peel served for three years in the Continental Army. And when Charles Wilson Peale was doing the, the portrait of Washington in 1783, James at the same time did this small portrait miniature. 
And one of the great things, Kathy Foster in her section in the book talks about kind of the warmth of this depiction. There's clearly kind of a beloved, you know, feeling that, um, that James Peel has for the, the sitter. And inside the, the gold case um, is um, some strands of Washington's actual hair. And the gold case was actually added in the 1840s. This, uh, the miniature descended in the Peel family. It was on a, a little um, matchbox on the cover of the matchbox. The, the painting on ivory was mounted on that. And then a, a volunteer militia in Pennsylvania um, purchased that and then did this incredible gold case and used it as kind of a presentation uh, piece for their, for their organization. And this is Washington crossing the Delaware on the other side is a scene of Mount Vernon. And there we go. So I'm gonna stop the share and I'm happy to go back to any images if somebody wants to see something again. But importantly, I'd love to open it up for discussion. Great. So um, anyone who has a question, I think we're a small enough group, folks can just unmute yourself and shout it out. And I encourage people, if you want to see everybody else, to switch to gallery view. If you're on a computer, that should be kind of near the upper right of your screen. That will give you all the Brady Bunch squares again. Uh, Richard Carroll Malone here. That yeah. was absolutely terrific. Uh, are you still keeping the collection at Arcadia and Chester Springs or have you other premises for it? So the, the house has now been sold. Um, and uh, that, that house, um, as you know, Carol, but for everybody else, that, that was um, sort of um, contiguous to all that other acreage. And my father had bought the house and, and right next door to all this other acreage that was used for the farm. And a lot of the co collection was in there. And then over the years, as he donated them to the foundation, um, they moved out of the house. But we ended up selling the house um, several years back. And now, um, luckily, all the land is under conservation easement. I haven't been back to the house. The, the present owners made a lot of changes. I'm not quite ready to see it. So. Well, I seem, to, I, I seem to remember your father hiring conservators who took Q-tips and, and removed the layers of paint in that, it, that it original part of the house, that's the study, um, yeah. in order to, to derive the original color from the, the first owners. So it, I'm, I hope they haven't changed it too much. Uh, I know, Carol. Well, no, it was an amazing place and it, it really had all those original layers. And, um, you know, he was, as you know, he really worked hard to try to bring that out. And the house, I mean, some of the walls, the insulation was actually mud and horsehair in that early room over room from 1721. And he did um, uh, remove some of the walls so that you could see um, through plexiglass some of that original. So this, the house was kind of this, you know, um, just kind of lighter fluid for his passion for collection, collecting. He loved it. Uh, on a lighter note, what have you done with his collection of porcelain pigs? Uh, well, actually, if people, um, if you can see behind me, there are what is porcelain in the shelves are pigs. And uh, my father just loved pigs. And, uh, you know, he sort of, I think it started off, he liked them and then people started giving him little pig tchotchkes and things and, and, and it was sort of off to the races. I do have a curio case that was his and I carefully put all the pigs in and then my kids keep sneaking in plastic pigs. And so it keeps getting added to, the collection grows. Sure, it still exists, glad to hear it. <laughs> Uh, it's great to see you, Carol. It's good to see you. Well, other, um, uh, does anyone want me to toggle back to images or, um, um, and actually, I'm sorry, I had said with that, that um, desk was actually Nathaniel Gould and the date on that 1765 um, to 1775. So somewhere in that kind of nine year, 10 year period and it's um, Salem, Mass. Um, so close to Boston, but, but Salem. Yeah, Toby. 
thank you for sharing. What, what a tremendous uh, uh, story. And I'm pleased to say that I, I have the book in my lap and I started uh, reading as you were presenting the pictures. And I was really intrigued um, that the collecting started in college, that it started in fine books and rare books uh, and through connections and mentorship. And it seemed like uh, rare books was the starting point. Could you walk us through the evolution of the collection and what inspired what and how this collection sort of formed? It seems like he's got a tremendous eye for beauty, um, but it started with just rare documents. How did we get to uh, a German uh, inspired uh, uh, Pennsylvania art? Can you walk us through the, the evolution of the collection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I'll pay you later for asking it. And uh, it's just a great kind of softball here. Um, yeah, so, so in college, again, you know, it was early books and it was just things that he liked to read. But when he got out and, um, you know, that was, it was an interesting time because he went on to business school and he continued when he got out to, to collect books. And so in his collection, you find these, these books that we, you know, went through in, in, the, in the old house. Um, but then in 1962, again, with the passing of his, of his father, it wasn't just uh, an added means. It was actually, there was, you know, that was a really, really difficult time in his life. So it was taking on this responsibility that he wasn't quite ready to take on, but he knew that he had to do it to the best of his ability. And he really threw himself entirely into that. But he also, um, I think, derived a tremendous amount of comfort from you know, his passion for history and objects and the people in this collecting field. So this you know, kind of community of collectors back then. And it was before eBay or you know, obviously, and before you could just call up and kind of say, what do you have? Or you know, it, was, it was really letters, it was visiting places, it was going to little antique shows, little auctions, and then it was the bigger auctions in New York. But by 1963, it was really some of those key, and it was those purchases in books and manuscripts that just kind of um, launched him as somebody who was serious in the field. And suddenly people, so that, that Washington letter was a dealer named Forrest Sweet. And Sweet had, you know, basically all of Sweet's collected, you know, sort of treasures from over the many years was being sold and my father picked some of the best ones. And immediately, you know, it was kind of like, who is this guy? And he was so young. And I think it's surprising. I mean, it's surprising to me and I, I grew up with him, but it's surprising to me still to think, you know, first of all, I, I don't collect like that. I, even if I had the means, I don't think I'd be collecting like that. But he had such a passion for it and such a passion at an early age and similarly such a passion to share it. So the foundation was established in 1963. Very quickly, he decided this is what the foundation should be. It shouldn't be a museum. It should be a, a, something that puts these things online. Um, but then again, with the, with the purchase of the house, it was off to the races on kind of filling the house, where well, you may have just heard some commotion in the background. Um, but it was off to the races, you know, filling the house, um, you know, furniture, paintings, everything. Uh, thanks. You know, it, it strikes me that at such a young age, he must have been very bold. And I'm wondering where uh, uh, that, that, does that run in the family, uh, dot, dot, dot. You know, it's um, to, to be on the scene and in a world where he didn't have a curator per se, right? I, this is all a reflection of his tastes and, and preferences. It, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, and I just wonder... What are the linkages uh, between some of these Americana and then Chinese uh, um, uh, artifacts? Is it the fact that uh, they were coming through the, uh, the Cincinnati Society? Is it the history linkage or is it the uh, aesthetic that was the link? Yeah, so the, I mean, great question again. The, the first piece that he collected of export porcelain and really the first piece of decorative art was one of Washington's um, two platters from the, the Society of the Cincinnati. And he had listened to a, a lecture by Eleanor Gordon, who at the time, and for many, many years, you know, decades after that, was the leading person in Chinese export porcelain for the American market. 
And um, that just, uh, you know, there was a fascination there and he um, started really collecting it. He did actually get very serious about it early on. And so by the 70s, um, he did have people who he'd hire to catalog, to, you know, take care of the collection. He was partnering with museums. He was um, curating his collection and, and really astutely saving. And this is one of the treasures we have are all these letters and files. And so that's a part of this, you know, we have all the provenance, not just how he bought it, but who else bought it along the way before him. And he was, he was great at that. And, and the people that he hired along the way were great at that. It was really important. Thanks. Yeah, thank got you. A question someone typed into the chat that I'll read, which is, can you explain a little more about the Franklin Magic Circles? Uh, yeah, so it, the circles, I mean, the, the circles basically, um, if I understand it, I don't know if I can, I don't, well, I don't want to go back to it. I'm going to end up losing you all. But um, they, if you look in the book, and you can actually even Google this, because I was curious, you know, how much are these known? And there are some great images online of, of the circle of circles. But it's as it emanates out, um, the numbers have to all sum to 360 degrees. So of course, around the circumference is 360 degrees, but all the sum of numbers. And Franklin went in and he, you know, figured out in all these emanating um, circles within the circle. So there's one big circle and then all these little rings of the circle, there are numbers around it. And no matter kind of what line you draw from any of those points, it sums to 360. And I'm afraid I don't know everything else he was going to describe to this, you know, fellow member of the Royal College. But there's more. <laughs> And someone else is asking, um, is the foundation still collecting? If not, was there an end date chosen? And if so, how? We are still collecting is the short answer, but not very much. And it, what we're doing is if there's something that we recognize that really fills a gap in something um, that, you know, we have two of, or maybe we have, you know, um, an artist who's a, a father and we recognize that the son was also an artist, um, we'll, we'll collect that. And uh, we're trying to, you know, sort of build the collection. But we also realized early on that we don't need to be encyclopedic at all. And one of the things you'll notice in the book is that it's really kind of a, you know, a lengthy stroll through history, but you're not going to get um, a preview of every aspect of colonial history or federal history. The, the objects that were chosen for each of the chapters were chosen by the authors. I, I consider it kind of a dream team of authors. And, um, you know, they're just kind of amazing preeminent people in each of those different categories of the collection. So we have a section on silver, we have export porcelain, we have whaling paintings, we have Pennsylvania German, which as Toby mentioned, that's a big part of the collection. And then furniture overall, um, and then I did an introductory section. And our hope really in the book is that people can learn a lot from all these objects and learn about history through the objects. But then it'll also really spur a curiosity about, about wanting to learn more. Yeah, I think that's reflected in the title, right? It's in pursuit of history. It's not, we did it, here's all the history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good <laughs> it's point. about that passion, that curiosity. I agree, yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or comments you want to share? Feel free to unmute and speak up or type into the chat. Nigel says, uh, great talk. Could you oh. please explain a little how the foundation decided to be a lending institution rather than creating a dedicated museum? Interesting trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah. So early on, my father had this thought of, of maybe creating a museum. And he realized quickly that that would be one, very expensive, and two, there are already great museums in the Philadelphia area. And so really pretty early on, he partnered with the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and that continues to be our close partner in this. The book is something that we, we published as a foundation, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, we did it in association with them. So they were a great source of advice and guidance, and then it's being distributed by Yale University Press. 
Um, but again, that, that idea to be a lending library was something that he saw as, a, as kind of a greater need to, to support these institutions that already exist. And so that started more in the Philadelphia area and now that's grown and we have things on loan at a whole range of different places, whether it's in New, New England or the South. Um, even the State Department diplomatic reception rooms have a number of objects. And then really importantly, smaller house museums. So places like the Jonathan Fisher House, um, these, these smaller museums um, I think are so important and they're a way, they're a gateway for people to learn. They're, they're essential for the community. And we can actually act in a way that a museum can't or won't. And so we just don't have the same red tape. We don't have the same concerns about climate and things like that. We of course do on things that are fragile, but if it's an object that isn't sensitive to climate, then you know we're very, very happy to have it in a place like that. Uh, Richard, have you, have you considered commissioning an edition of the book for middle school children, say, as a way into American history for uh, fourth graders? That's a neat idea, Carol. Uh, that really is a neat idea. Um, I, I mean, I would love to find some way to do that, to reach that audience. It's hard to envision how, but, but I know that it, I mean, we all know it can be done again by Hamilton. You know, I, I just, uh, I bought Girl Scout cookies with a $10 bill, like, you know, two years ago. And this uh, probably 10 year old, I bought the cookies from said, ooh, Alexander Hamilton, you know? And it's just amazing what that has done um, for history, things like that. So I, I don't know, it's something we're really grappling with because there's obviously a real need for kids to learn more about history. And I think that the objects are really key um, I'm involved a bit with the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. And one of the things we've done a lot of focus group work, work with school groups. And one of the things that we realized in working with teachers is that there's a thirst for objects that, you know, it's one thing, all the online stuff and all the kind of, you know, images of, of anything you want to see, but, but actually seeing an object is something that's really inspiring. So I think again, and that's where these manuscripts, these letters are really fascinating because the fragility of them, the fact that you look at it and it's really Franklin's hand or Washington's hand and you just think, you know, it kind of gives you chills to actually see that and to, you know, kind of interact with that, with that object. And I will say that um, all, well, about a thousand works like that are at Wesleyan University at their um, special collection. And so we work a lot with the students at Wesleyan the faculty there utilize these objects for teaching. And there's a wonderful um, professor who runs the um, social studies department, a guy named uh, Demetrius Udall. And he and his staff have been working with these and we're trying to do more of that, have them work more with them. And if any of you were ever in the Wesleyan area, I'd be happy to you know, um, have you be able to take a gander at some of this stuff. That's in Middletown, Connecticut. I just want to add, as an art teacher for many, many years, when I had objects that um, I brought in that were authentic and old and allowed the kids to feel them and smell them, it was amazing. It just transported them into something entirely different than learning from uh, videos or you know, stuff that they had to read. This was real stuff and they could go back hundreds of years and smell and touch. I agree, I agree. Magic, so wonderful work that you do and hopefully, you know, schools will pick you up on that. Uh, well, thank you, Margaret. I agree with you. And I think, you know, that's part of the beauty of visiting places like the Jonathan Fisher House and other historic houses is that ability to kind of be transported back and for kids to do that. And you're right, to hold an object, to touch an object, it's, it's really, um, I think it's inspiring for kids. Yeah, thank you for that. Anyone else what? have a question they'd like to ask? Were you gonna say something, Richard? Well, I was just gonna say one funny aside is, um, mm -hmm. I had to give a talk like this uh, for Mount Vernon and I was talking to 
um, our family around the dinner table about Mount Vernon and um, about Washington and about the place. And actually my youngest gardener, who's 12 now um, said, well, George Washington loved oyster ice cream. And I thought, oh, that's crazy, that can't be. And sure enough, I Googled that. Now, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed I didn't know that, but she picked that up on some school trip. So, I mean, these things, these kids listen to this stuff. But that sort of struck a chord and as repulsive as oyster ice cream sounds, after a little while of talking about it, I sort of thought, I wanna try some oyster ice cream. Like how bad can it be and if Washington liked it? So I don't know, maybe that's a fishnet flavor for next summer, you know, oyster ice cream. There's an investment idea for sure. Yeah, don't invest, but. <laughs> Well, I live right behind behind the fish set. I'll suggest that to Curtis when fish net opens next time. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Bobby likes ice cream with lobster in it. That's what I heard. Exactly. Yeah. He visited Maine. Could be a whole a whole group of flavors. <laughs> thank you, Richard. This was wonderful. Oh, Alma, thank you. It's thank so good you. to see you learn about your family and everything. I've always wanted to know more about this, so uh, it's great. Well, I'm so, I'm so touched that all of you um, have invested this time and, um, and I really mean it. So if somebody's bought the book or thinking about buying the book, please email me and I'd, I'd love to write a note and um, just that you could stick in the book. And again, my email is hrichardietrich, all one word, Dietrich, D-I-E-T-R-I-C-H at uh, yahoo.com. And then our foundation website, if you want to learn more about the foundation, it's not a really extensive site, but you can actually search by object on there and you can learn a lot about the different objects and a bit about what we do. And that's dietrichamericanfoundation.org, all one word. Richard, it seems it seems a shame to let you go. I know that that's sort of a closing note, but could I, could I ask one just um, uh, slightly crazy question? But in your book, there are these scenes of of the house that you must have grown up in, filled with beautiful items. What's the thing that you broke that your father didn't forgive you for? <laughs> yeah, I you know, thankfully, I never really broke anything. Um, terrible, but um, but actually that Paul Revere teapot, I did lift that up once, and it had a it has if you can you know see that in the book it has a wooden handle and the handle came loose, and I was terrified um, that I broke it, and in fact it was always loose, but but luckily I didn't then you know drop it or something and just put a huge dent in it. Um, we didn't have a cat in the house growing up, so that's a good thing. We didn't, you know, have a cat knocking things like that off shelves. Um, but yeah, yeah, I broke other things, but not nothing, nothing that rare, luckily. Fantastic. Well, thank you again. Yeah, yeah I'd like to invite everyone to everybody unmute yourselves and let's give Richard a big hand and thank you and cheer and it'll be crazy and chaotic, but it's, it feels good, I promise. Oh, yeah. oh, yay. Yay. Thank, you, <laughs> thank you, Richard. Hey, well, thank you all. Richard. Wonderful. Uh, Richard. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Hannah, thanks to you for all your help on this. Yes. Thank you. And to the rest of the staff at the library. It's just a tremendous resource. And um, we're all it's been a pleasure. We're all um, you know, just so grateful that it's there. Well, it was great, Vicky. You met all right. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night, really wonderful to see you all. I, I miss you Good all, and can't wait see to see you soon. soon. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you again. Good night. Good night.